Hello and welcome to the Car Kernel channel and welcome to the 2024 Mazda CX-90 inline 6. A huge deal, a very important car for Mazda. Mazda has been changing their direction lately. In such a small company, they've been coming up with really cool cars. They're trying to position themselves into the luxury market. And this is a proper one. This is the one that they did from the ground up. And you can expect to see the technology in this car trickle down to other models as time passes. However, there is one thing to be said. They went a little too far as you'll find out in this video right after this. Let's start with our technical review under the hood and underneath all the sea of plastic covers is a surprise. A surprise that not many people anticipated in 2023, 2024 model year, an inline six cylinder engine. An engine that we thought was being phased out because simply too big to fit in most cars, but here it is. And not only that, there's a second surprise because it is an enormous inline six. This is not a front wheel drive car that is made to all wheel drive by connecting the rear. This is a rear wheel drive car with the front wheels driven as well as part of the all-wheel drive, which is very interesting to see in 2023. Let's start with kind of the basic mechanical construction of this all-new inline six. The valve cover is a plastic valve cover, very standard right now in the industry. Everybody's using it. Seems like very well made, very high quality, which is good. And then the cylinder head is a single piece cylinder head, enormous cylinder head. Usually inline sixes have an enormous cylinder head. So it's a single piece, does have dual overhead cam, and it has cam caps and everything, nothing unusual business there. But then we move into the timing chain. And this is where I will call this section the uh, German engine special. So for reasons beyond the knowledge or comprehension of anyone, this engine has a timing chain in the rear, not in the front. Kind of like BMW's B58 very popular engine but I don't understand why car manufacturers do that and Mazda now join suit so every time you want to do a timing chain replacement job which in an engine configuration like this would be a breeze if it was in the front because you have all this room uh, you have to pull the engine out of the car and disassemble half of this car which speaking of disassembling half of this car this will be the theme disassembling half the car Let's dive in further and you'll see what I mean. So this engine has hydraulic lifters, which is nice. Of course, it's a modern engine with rocker rollers, very standard design that a lot of manufacturers use. Then we go into the timing chain orientation, which is very, very strange. So this engine has a total of three timing chains. One of them is for the oil pump, which by the way, the oil pump on this is a variable oil pump, electronically controlled. It can vary the pressure, depends on engine RPM very accurately, not just chain, you know, driven by the RPM of the engine. So that's nice. But uh, what is not nice is this. There is one chain that goes from the camshaft to a sprocket. And then there's another chain that goes from that sprocket to the crankshaft. An initial look, you look at it, it's like, this is unnecessary. Why is there this little sprocket sitting in the middle? Until you realize that that sprocket drives the high pressure fuel pump. Talk about that in a little bit down the video. Very unnecessary. And being that this chain is in the back of the engine, let's mention that one more time. I don't know what they were going with this. That's okay. Not the end of the world. Let's keep going. Now this engine, of course, has variable valve timing. On the intake, it is an electronic variable valve timing. So Electric motor drives the inner side of the gear. When that motor speeds up, the inner gear turns the outside gear and it advances the timing. If it slows down, it does the opposite. And if it spins at the same speed as the camshaft, we're at base timing. This design sounds like a disaster waiting to happen, but actually it's been out for a few years and it's proven pretty reliable. Except on this one, uh, because it's in the back, it's extremely difficult to get to the motor, so I guess that takes that away. And then on the exhaust side is simple oil operated, nothing really fancy there. Then this engine is also turbocharged, and it has a pretty massive turbocharger because this is not a little four-cylinder, this is an inline-six. 
So we have a very large turbo. This turbo is coolant and oil cooled, which is pretty standard with turbos for a very long time. But here's where things are modern. This does not have an air-to-air -air intercooler. This has actually a liquid-to-air intercooler with its own separate circuit of coolant to cool that charge. That intercooler sits in the intake manifold, making the piping very simple and it's actually very efficient. So this has a separate cooling system for that, separate reservoir, same coolant type, but electric water pump, separate radiator, oddly enough on one side of the car. It's just, this has a radiator in the front and one radiator on the side and nothing on the other side. That's fine, that's not an issue. And then the turbocharger wastegate is electronically controlled. Not ideal for reliability because you have an electronic component in a very hot area. Eventually something's gonna happen with it. But one thing have to be said, some of the turbo is visible, the rest it is not. You just kind of see part of it and the rest is buried. And if you wanna get it unburied, out comes the engine and something they call the capsule, which in translation from German, the front clip has to come out for anything for this engine to happen because before we move on, I have to say one thing. I've never seen a big car like this with a big engine like this so cramped. The space here is unbelievably small. The strut towers intrude so much into the engine space that it takes all this, this is no space. Anything you want to do with this engine, it comes off the car. Speaking of things that you must remove half this car apart to remove it, the fuel system. This has direct injection only. Not ideal for reliability, longevity because of carbon buildup, but is total unknown if this engine will be prone to carbon buildup or not as bad. But it will eventually build it. It's direct injection only. But here is the curious thing. Most cars, and when I say most cars, I mean all cars that have direct injection of one way, shape, or form, they all have a high pressure fuel pump that pressurizes the fuel that comes from the other fuel pump from the fuel tank to right around 3000 PSI. Standard, nothing really about it. Usually most cars will have it on top of the valve cover. It's driven by the camshaft, very simple, two bolts comes out. This one, however, they did not want to do that. They went the extreme German route of how do we make this very complicated and very difficult unnecessarily. So the fuel pump in this sits underneath the intake manifold. It just literally just sits on the block. Do you remember when we talked about the uh, timing chain that that one sprocket? That was actually a shaft that in a very complicated fashion spins the fuel pump. So that's not too bad, right? Okay, so you have to remove the intake manifold to remove the fuel pump. Not the end of the world, except it is. Because to replace the high pressure fuel pump on this car, you have to remove the engine out of the car. And I guess that's the part where things really start to go downhill with this inline six. Anything you want to do with this engine, short from pulling the very nice cover that has the very nice hook on it, you need to remove the engine out of the car, which involves disassembling the entire capsule or front clip. They didn't think that one through very well, did they now? Let's talk about the cooling systems, because this engine has two cooling systems. One of them, we briefly talked about it, it's for the intercooler, has its own electric water pump, that's very simple. Then the main cooling system, and this is where there's a question mark. The cooling system is very basic, extremely basic actually in this, although it's buried and you can't see half of it, but it has a mechanical water pump, it has a normal thermostat, Really nothing about it, radiator in the front, heater core inside, no fancy valves, no nothing, which is kind of a surprise. But here is the other thing that uh, they couldn't leave the co simple cooling system alone. This engine has two drive belts. One of them goes from the crank to the water pump, which is our special, special belt. It's a stretch belt. Not special at all, it's actually very annoying. And the second one goes only from the crankshaft to the compressor. Hence, there's no alternator here. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit. But that one gets the privilege of an automatic hydraulic tensioner. Very nice. It's a Swiss, they would have made one belt with that tensioner, would have been much better. And at this point in the video, if you thought this was complicated or too complicated, we're just getting started. Mazda wanted to do a hybrid. 
that's okay. Everybody's doing hybrids these days, but they did not want to do the normal hybrid route that everybody else is doing. They wanted their own version of that. And they went so far to and achieved so little, it is unbelievable. So this glorious system is called the Mazda M Boost mild hybrid system. So it's not really a real hybrid. So this powertrain, aside from the mega complicated inline six, has a standard eight speed transmission. Automatic, nothing really about it. Except Mazda deemed the torque converter was an antiquated thing and we do not want such thing in our inline six flagship. So they did this. They don't have a torque converter. They have a clutch from a manual transmission that is electronically and hydraulically engaged and disengaged. So this is a manual transmission, but it isn't because the transmission is not a manual transmission or DCT or any of that because they rejected the DCT here. But wait, if you think this is complicated enough, there is way more complicated stuff here. The mild hybrid system, the M Boost. It is basically a 48 volt system, which Mercedes actually started doing a lot while back. And now it is in the Mazda. It is hardly a hybrid system proper, but let's get into it so you can understand what's going on here. So this is a normal gasoline engine with a normal eight speed transmission with a hydraulic clutch in between. But right behind that clutch though, there's a small electric motor. And when I say small, it is tiny, unpowerful motor because it runs off 48 volts, very behind the typical hybrid voltage of 350 plus. So this motor, it can recuperate energy and charge the tiny 48 volt lithium ion battery. And then when you're driving, it'll assist or it'll generate to charge the 12 volt battery, which basically sounds like a very fancy, very expensive alternator. But wait, it does more here. So this car has a system called iStop, which is a very fancy term for start-stop technology. Basically something we all dislike, but it's there for emissions and I understand why. So when you stop at a traffic light, engine shuts off, that's what we're used to. But this takes it to the next level. When you're driving and you let go of the gas, the car will shut off the engine and you'll be coasting. And when you accelerate, that little motor, that the M Boost motor, it will start driving the car and start the engine and all of a sudden you're going again. But then when you accelerate really hard, this same motor will assist the engine. And for reasons beyond my comprehension on anybody's comprehension, why does an inline six engine need the assistance of a tiny 48 volt electric motor? For efficiency, yes but it's not really like that in the real world. And that's when things start to really fall apart here. So let's say a few things about that motor. That motor can charge the battery. It can boost and assist the engine. It can drive very, very short time while the engine is starting in an I-stop operation. And additionally, it can also act as a generator and it also starts the engine. So this car does not have an alternator. So because you have that motor, it's always spinning with the trans and it charges the 12 volt battery and powers everything else, which is nice. But then this engine also has a starter because there are cases where that battery is simply too weak and the engine is too cold and it cannot start it. So this still has a conventional starter, which you will hear start this engine when you start a cold and in specific operating conditions, it'll bypass the electric motor and use the regular starter. Now, all this, sounds great this is groundbreaking technology and it is but it achieves absolutely nothing because when you go drive this powertrain it is not very refined the engine sounds beautiful it is an inline six nothing sounds like an inline six let's get that out of the way here but the level of mega complication that they went through here to achieve something that is hardly impressive and that is the sad reality. Anything you wanna do with this drivetrain, it has to come out of the car. It adds an unbelievable amount of complication to achieve absolutely nothing spectacular. And that is the sad reality of the inline six from Mazda.
Let's take a look underneath the 24 CX90. Starting with everything is covered up. I mean, it's so extremely covered up that you can't even see the transmission. That's just how Mazda deemed it. But there is an access hole right here for like your simple oil change service, which is nice. But then we pay our attention to the front suspension, which is completely aluminum except a few things. This design is very interesting and it looks looks like a rear wheel drive car with, a, with an oil drive added to it because that's what it is. You look here, you have the shock, which is not air suspension or anything. It has this little contraption that goes over the control arm. Control arm, interesting, is a two piece, half steel, half aluminum. Don't know why they decided to do that, but that's how they went with it. And then a very, very small sway bar in the link in the front. I mean, this thing is tiny. Ball joint is part of the control arm, which is a, not the best idea in the planet. Basically, if this ball joint goes out, you have to replace the whole arm, not something separate. But at least it separates easily from the knuckle, which is good. Two piston caliper in the front. Business as usual, everything else. Pretty standard for a rear wheel drive car. The axle is actually very small. This is an oil drive configuration. And the thing about this engine is the axle goes through the oil pan, kind of like Lexus does. Not the best idea for service later down the road, but that's how they did it for space. Then we move in the middle where you absolutely can't see nothing. I mean, nothing here, nothing, nothing. The transmission is somewhere in this area. It's an eight speed transmission. Fortunately, you can't really see it. And everything here is very covered up. But uh, interestingly, this has a lot of bends. So there's a lot going on because in this general area, the battery also lives here. So that's, there's a lot more here than in your standard car. If you notice the exhaust takes a very, it comes out the side because it's an inline six and then centers itself to the middle and then goes to the back. Speaking of the back, it is also extremely covered. Interestingly, with very heavy duty metal covers because those cover the massive differential. This is, of course, a rear wheel drive bias car, so the rear differential does most of the driving and it is massive, all aluminum. The best part is they put these, these shields to protect the differential, but yet the fins for the differential, they stick past it. So I don't know what happened there, that's okay. And then there's something extremely interesting in the back. Let's look at the rear suspension first, then we'll talk about it. This is a double wishbone setup, very standard, multi-arm coil spring in the back, steel subframe. Things are very standard here. There's a mix of aluminum, aluminum knuckle, single piston caliper, electronic parking brake, all that good stuff. But I would like you to notice the very surprising absence of a sway bar. Yes, this car has no rear sway bar. Again, for reasons unknown. I was very shocked to see that it has no rear sway bar. And that perhaps adds to why this car wallows a little bit when you make turns. It's, it feels very heavy when you turn, it just leans too much. And I can start to see why that is. It is a very surprising decision from Mazda. The exhaust is actually very high quality, double wall stuff and it exits out both sides. And you notice there's no tip that protrudes through the bumper, it's just the tips are right here. And they did that for aerodynamic because you notice everything's covered up, including the control arms, including the back. You just wanted it to have an almost flat belly, and it does for that matter, because when the car is down on the ground, this control arm will actually be pushed up and this will be almost completely flat. This is pretty interesting. Still can't get over why we don't have a sway bar here, but that's, they didn't deem it necessary, I suppose. Let's take a look at the outside of the 24 CX-90. One thing I have to be said, this is a very, very good looking car. I mean, Mazda for the longest time, it's been a minute now, they've been making really good looking car. This one takes things to the next level, folks. I love this front end. I mean, it's not over the top, but less is more in this design. There's little touches that make it special. And look at this headlight, such a small headlight, but this cutout in it and this light that comes through, it's just 
it's something very beautiful and very eye-pleasing to look at. And then the front here, it's not just flat. It has actually a push inside, then it comes out. It just looks very, very nice. I really like this design of this car. This looks very cool. And then there is, again, less is more. You only have one line on the hood, comes down, same thing on the other side. It's not really a lot going on, but it's very special. This hood is very long. And if you come look at it from this side, it's a very long hood. You look at it in pictures, it doesn't do it justice. It's super long because the inline six and all the complication that comes with that. You look here, there's this little interesting corner of the hood. Pretty interesting how they got everything to work. Fit to finish here is impeccable, I have to be said as well. The wheel is interesting. It's a 21 inch wheel with a 275 tire. That's a pretty wide tire and you feel it. You feel, you feel when you turn the wheel, just it's a big heavy tire. And then of course they do have this buckle design to make it wider, but this is actually wider. If you look at the side profile, this is out and the back is out which gives it a very interesting profile on the side. And over here, very proudly, inline six in a very classy font. I really like that touch. They're really proud of the inline six. And I wish they would have made it a little bit less complicated, but that's okay. Then we look at the doors. The doors have a very interesting shape. They're very tall, but the window is also very tall. And the side profile of this, this thing, just, it's a very nice side profile. It just, it's very classy, it's very luxurious. I think the design on the outside is extremely striking and that is one of the huge pluses for this one. And over here you have this chrome line that runs across. It says Mazda. It doesn't really, usually car manufacturers, they'll put the model here. Mazda put Mazda. And that's what they decided to go with. Then a very interesting shape for the fuel door even that it's not just a box and it's a push open it is not a capless this car does take premium fuel it is recommended not required but that's what they went with then we roll around the back and the back looks very nice you know they changed the head I, you can tell that there's a new design language and it's almost like a bubble you notice this this surface is slanted this way and then it comes down. It looks super nice. And that's what they're calling their new drivetrain E Sky Active G. I suppose that's just marketing names, I suppose. But there's something with the bumper here. This bumper is very small. So anything you hit is going to hit the back door, actually. And that's the only compromise. Many manufacturers are going with this design. And there's no physical holes for the tailpipes you don't really see them they're hidden inside and then we open the back door which is just a power back door the glass doesn't open and there come a surprise you notice the third row seat is up you still have room here and that is pretty cool what i love about it the most is there isn't a complicated thing to stow the seats you just pull this here goes the seat. You pull this, seat goes away. You want the third row seat back up, you just pull on this, and it's back. Very simple operation. And then you have a, like a household style power outlet here. Very cool. And right next to it, you have a cigarette lighter, which is interesting why that is not USB-C, but that's what they decided to do here. And then I'm also happy to announce that there was at least one old school designer in this design team because when you pull this and you figure out how this comes up it's very difficult i am happy to announce that there is a spare tire that is very interesting this car is like a massive modern machine and here is a spare tire very cumbersome to get out though yeah it have to be said in this whole thing you have to disassemble it and push this so I guess uh, he was not a very popular fella, the one that wanted to put a spare tire in this because that's what you have to do just to open the uh, compartment. Okay, we're done. 
Now, this does have the electronic motors integrated into the shocks. That is the design everybody's going with. And then there's something interesting. Let's close the door and we'll talk about it. Even though this glass looks like it's a big glass, but it is slanted. So your view in the rear view mirror is actually a little bit on the obstructed side because this is very tall. It's, it's hard to describe it, but visibility through the rear view mirror is not the greatest in this car. And it gets even worse when the third row seat is up with the headrests up. It's not the best vision out of the rear. But wait, there is more because when they went all super complicated and overcomplicated everything in this car, there is one thing they did. So this car has an eye active sense, which is what Mazda is calling their latest safety tech. 99% of cars out there that has pre-collision will have the radar sensor right here, which is pretty standard. This one also has it right here. But this one takes it to the next level because this has a cross pre-collision as well. So behind the bumper, there is a radar sensor here and there's another radar sensor here. So this has three radar sensors in the front so it could pick up a potential collision from the side, not only from the front. And lastly, there is one more interesting thing about this car. The back door. When you open it, most cars, this is how far the door will open. But this one, ladies and gentlemen, this is a 90 degree opening door. Possibly the best idea there is. I wish every car door opened like this because this makes entry here super easy. You can get a lot more stuff here easier. This is a 90 degree door, which is, this is how much normal car doors, even a little bit less than that, this is a 90 degree door. This is very impressive. The front one, not so much, but it's still a pretty wide opening because the door shape is an interesting one. Let's talk about the interior of the 2024 Mazda CX-90. And this is where things start to turn around. I really like this interior. I think they did a really fine job. This is very classy very nice to look at everything here is put together in a way that just makes sense this is an easy car to live with i really like this interior let's talk about some highlights the infotainment system you know mazda has always been a little bit on the conservative side with infotainments they don't update them very often but this infotainment system at first glance it looks like it's exactly the same as the old one but it actually is not and they've updated it very well it's not too much it's not too complicated there's a lot of customizations here it is a touch screen but you still have the rotary dial here and the volume it looks very similar but it is updated and i love how they updated it. they took what they have and they just made it better they didn't start from the ground up and now with all the glitches and everything it's very seamless and works really well wireless apple cow play I really like this radio. It has to be said, this is really well done. It has a ton of customizations. I love it. In addition to that, they did not go too far with this. This is where they didn't. Because if you look in the center stack here, all your HVAC controls are physical button. There's literally nothing in the screen. And that's how you want it. I just want to change my cooled seat. Well, it's just a button. I press it here and we're done. I don't have to go through 17 menus. No, I just want to change the temperature. It's right here. All the controls are right in front of you. And that makes living with this car simpler. Then you look at the center console area. You have this rotary dial in a super nice location and it works very well. I have the truth have to be said. Parking brake, auto hold. Unfortunately, auto hold still, every time you start the car, you have to press it again to engage it. It doesn't save the memory. And then there is the shifter which is a very strange configuration and initially when you look at it it reminds me of the at least the bottom of it of an atari 2600 joystick that's the best way i'm going to describe it we'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later in the video you also have your drive mode select which makes a very satisfying sound when you click it feels very high quality so the gauge is all screen and i have to say the truth here it is a useless screen because it basically mimics gauges and then when you engage the eye active system which is their safety system it changes a little bit but that's all it does 
they would have been gauges with a little screen would have been the same one thing i have to be said the heads-up display is huge and it displays so much i think that's where the screen the gauge screen kind of makes makes it up in the heads-up display so that is nice something else about this interior the materials are not the nicest you have a lot of plastic right in front of you and it just doesn't feel very luxury like the suede is nice although it's not very practical suede on the seats speaking of the seats they're super comfortable and that is a huge plus for a car like this steering wheel leather feels very nice but the seats ed edges at least in here doesn't feel they say napa leather but it doesn't feel as nice center console opens on both ways and it is tiny for a car this big this is going to be a family car this is a very small center console let's take a look at the back seat of the cx90 this is my driving position i'm 5'7 i have plenty of room this is a very comfortable seat truth to have to be said that this is a nice place to be here however there are a few things here so the back of the seat is completely wrapped with leather which is nice but it doesn't feel like a the nice napa leather that is something interesting but then over here in the middle you have your hvac controls for the rear cooled and heated seats for the back seat here which is nice but there's something very curious you have all this massive screen for controls but you only have two vents here there's no vents here nothing on the roof nothing you just have these all this giant control panel for two little vents that's okay that's not the end of the world but what is almost the end of the world is the center console which i do not understand i don't get it's an option so that's good you can get this with captain chairs or just a bench which i highly recommend because this takes the best feature in captain chair cars where your kids can go to the third row without having to disassemble the seat and all that and it also has a little center console which surprisingly is twice the size as the one in the front i wish this was backwards but that's what they did here and this is of course a three row suv the third row seats two people and it is very small i mean if you're an adult i have the seat pushed if you're an adult this is a very cramped space but there are a few things that are not ideal this seat's very low to the ground and then you have a hump here that even takes more out of your space i feel like if you sit in the middle you'd have more space i hope that makes sense but then there are a few things that are very interesting here you have a little vent actually on both sides here hvc vent wish this vent was like on the roof for the second row seat would have worked better but they don't but they also have a usb-c here two of them one on each side so at least when you're cramped here you have some amenities better than nothing let's talk about some things i do not like about the 2024 mazda cx90 unfortunately there is quite a few things here folks first thing is let's forget about the complications of how things are made let's talk about the basics the doors you open the door it feels extremely flimsy the handle the sound it makes you close the door it feels like a very cheap car nothing is falling apart but they could have intentionally made the doors feel heavier intentionally made them make a nicer thud because that's really the first thing any luxury car buyer is going to do open the door look inside it just doesn't feel like a luxury car it feels actually lesser than an economy car that's how it is and when you close the door the bottom trim just rattles and shakes that's not very good not the end of the world door is not falling apart anytime soon hopefully but then we move to the next thing in the air pursuit of making this unique and special luxurious the shifter it is possibly the most annoying shifter i've ever seen in the automotive industry so that travel from park to reverse neutral it is unnatural it takes you a minute to get used to it it's very clunky i wish they would have just made the same orientation as all other mazda models or just make something a little bit better this is probably the worst one that I have seen so far from all the cars we've reviewed. And then there is one more thing. Luxury cars usually will take their base, like the economy models, and make them better. You want to lock the doors. Of course, this has a smart key system where you touch the handle, unlocks, you swipe your finger, it locks. But only has it in the front doors. And here's a $60,000 car with no rear locking or rear sensors to open the door and lock it. You know, this is what luxury car buyers want, because otherwise, 
every car in 2023 and 2024 can be an option to have a smart key that doesn't have that, but they're economy cars. But then we get into the biggest thing. They were so obsessed in making this exclusive, unique, luxurious, that they focused all their budget on the powertrain. A powertrain that although it is class leading in its miles per gallon, it's not really impressive. And the other thing is, while it is impressive and, and very bold and brave for a car company to come out with an inline six in a 2024, which something that got us all very excited. But then when you start looking into it, they really did not go the simple route. Let's keep things simple, let's make it good and go. No, I feel like they were intentional about making things extremely complicated. I mean, I'm sorry, rear chain, you have to pull the engine to replace a chain? What happened there? Where did luxury turn into extreme unreliability? Because if you ask luxury car buyers, expensive repair bills is not part of the luxury. I can guarantee you that. People work very hard for their money and they don't want to buy a car that intentionally makes things complicated just so the repair bills will be very, very high. And as a mechanic, I can guarantee you one thing. Perhaps this car will be reliable, and I hope so. Mazda's been making good cars lately. But repair bills, when they do come, they will be very large because this is extremely complicated. They went way too far. And then the last thing is the feel of the car. See, Mazda's lately, they handle really nice. Look, they're not sports cars or all that, but compared to their rivals in the segment, they were always leading in the handling department. You get an SUV, it handles very nice. But this, it just doesn't handle very well. I mean, you feel the weight of that giant powertrain, the giant inline six, it understeers a lot and it feels very wobbly. Something unnatural for Mazda. I mean, you go drive a CX-9, which is an ancient thing that needs updating already, drives it's more stable than this. And that's a sad reality. But then it gets worse. This mild, unnecessary hybrid system, while it sounds good and it's smooth running and you don't feel like, unlike like a normal hybrid with a CVT drone, doesn't have that. But the delays of engagement and disengagement, they're very noticeable. And every time you decelerate and the eye stop starts and then you want to go again, there's a noticeable delay. It's, it also feels like another system in its infancy. It's not mature. They didn't work out every little thing. And there is nothing that kills your luxurious drive other than you push the gas and nothing happens for a second. And that's something you will feel not too long after you drive this car. The delays are long. We're going to have to sit down and talk about this one. Should you buy a 2024 Mazda CX-90? Folks, for those who are into technology and tech geeks, I am one of those people. This is a marvel of engineering. They really went to extreme lengths to make this something truly special. But unfortunately, we live in the real world, and this is a car for the masses. And when the real world comes in, this is simply too much. It is too complicated. They did so many things that are way too stretched past what is normal just to achieve this luxury or exclusive status. But unfortunately, that translates into extreme expenses. I mean, anything you do with this engine, it has to come out. It is so cramped, so complicated. There's so much going on that achieves almost nothing. If this would have had just a normal inline six with the normal eight speed transmission, it would have been perfectly fine. But all this complication of this mild hybrid system adds nothing. Because I'm sorry, even though it's a class leading gas mileage of 25 miles per gallon, it's hardly impressive. Because you can go to any hybrid in this segment that probably gets better gas mileage. The only thing this has over a regular hybrid is this drives nicer feels like a normal car. However, that does come at the price of the delays. I and mean, the delays can be extremely annoying. And sometimes, dare I say, alarming. You're merging into traffic and you need to really accelerate a little bit harder. The delays will get you. And that is the downside of this overcomplicated system for nothing. And as a mechanic, I will say this. I hope the reliability will be good. But I'll tell you one thing that I see. 
when this gets older and it's a machine just like everything else, even if it's built very well, something will happen that will need taken care of. And the repair bills on this will be extremely expensive because it is extremely complicated, unnecessarily, I might add. And I feel like they really wanted to do the luxury car theme, but they followed the wrong example. They didn't follow the example of Lexus, Acura, even Infiniti, Genesis. No, they didn't go that route. They went the BMW, Mercedes-Benz route. We're going to make everything very complicated, very exclusive. It will make every tech geek get very happy until the car runs out of warranty. And then the question mark. And it is a question mark. Reliability is a big question mark for this car because there's simply too much going on that achieves absolutely nothing special, in my opinion. Folks, I hope this video was helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. And until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.